Good morning. The title for the talk today is Stop Being a Victim. I almost never have the title for a talk figured out before I give it, but I thought of this a couple of weeks ago. Last week, as you know, some of you were here, we had a big celebration. One day I was riding in a car with a couple of folks. A little girl was in the back and I was a passenger. And we were going down Highway 18 into Apple Valley. And as we came upon Central, there's a light and a lady uh, who was busy taking care of the bottle of whiskey between her legs uh, went through that light at about approximately 60 miles an hour when it was red and T-boned it. And uh, the little girl in the back seat was asleep and had her head against the door so that banged herself pretty good against that door, chipped a few teeth, had to go to the dentist. And uh, when I got out of the car, uh, it was a small car, and three of the wheels were still on the ground, and one wheel was about this much above the ground. And it was decided that the car was totaled. And we got out, and uh, little girl went to the hospital to be checked out. Everything checked out. She was okay. And uh, went to my chiropractor. At that time I was struggling with my back after years of working on cars for a living. My back wasn't very happy with me so I went in. And he said, by golly, yes, you've got whiplash and we'll need to what were you planning on doing this summer? And I said, well, we were going to do a little trip here and there. He said, well, you need to come in twice a week for the next month and kind of get things adjusted. A few years later, the monk that moved up here with me, who was named Tom Hien, his uh, name he was first given when he became a Buddhist was Puja, Puja Muktika, and Puja means gift, and he was a great gift to me, helped me with everything. And uh, years later, as we were up here and we built the buildings here, he was working a variety of jobs, an incredibly intelligent man. And I talked him into becoming a teacher. And uh, usually when I give advice, I, I tell all the monks here, uh, don't get too wrapped up in the advice you give people because nobody will ever follow it. So, you know, don't, don't worry about it too much. People will come to you and say, what should I do? And whatever you tell them, they'll do the opposite. Now there's a there's a, like a reverse psychology for that, right? If you tell them the thing that you don't want them to do, then maybe they'll do the thing you want them to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm really unhappy with my wife. I want to get a divorce. Well, you should try to make it last a little bit long. No, go ahead and get that divorce. You show her. Um, so we were coming home from the high school over in Asperia and this lady who was driving an old Oldsmobile, it was probably at that time 20 years old, something like that, it was a boat, just this huge car. And uh, Pooja, because I had talked him into becoming a school teacher, I said this is a really good thing for a monk to do. Monks are supposed to be like teachers anyway. And he had a, a brand new car, it was six months old. It was a Mercury Sable, pretty little car. And uh, we were driving down, we were in the fast lane because Main Street in this area, every day there's accidents. It's like every day there's two or three accidents on that road. Particularly people trying to cross the road rather than going down to a light, they'll just go ahead and cross the road and get in the way of somebody. And so I'm a passenger and I'm 
riding along, and, and I see out of the corner of my eye, I see this car coming at me. Well, the traffic had stopped over here, and a very nice man had parked and stopped back of the exit of this parking lot so that this person could get out. You know, you've probably done it for people while they'll never get out of here because of the flow of traffic. Well, he stopped back, and I saw him as we were coming up. I saw he stopped, and I saw this very large Oldsmobile 98. And the lady in there, instead of like pulling out and getting into traffic, she decided she wanted to cross the road all the way. And just go to Hesperia, 3 o'clock on, it's like L.A. And there, there is no opportunity to get across the road. And she gunned that puppy, and she came off of that because the parking lot was above the road. She came off, and I heard this sound, and it was very much like something going airborne. And as I looked over, I saw that her car was off the ground. And it hit right in the door, right there. And she hit hard enough to that door that she, because I pulled away like this, you know. But she still banged my ribs. And uh, it was a lot of fun because when, when everything came to a stop, her license plate was buried in the door. When we got out and looked at the car, it was, she had hit the door, and the metal of the door had folded around the license plate of her car. And so, and then they had us, and this is when center consoles were becoming, everybody had them, bucket seats and center consoles. So here I am, banged in the ribs, trying to crawl over this thing to get out. She wasn't a very good driver. And so it wasn't a real big surprise when the police came. And uh, she, had a, she had a story to tell. It's like back when the lady who had a bottle of whiskey, who was fall down drunk, came over to me, yeah, it is, it's not a issue. And, uh, you know, the, the whiskey had spilled on her. And of course, she went to jail. And the other lady, I'm not sure what happened with her. The car was still movable. Um, and it actually got fixed because uh, the insurance company saved four thousand dollars by having this car completely rebuilt, and the lady that had been driving had two small children in the back seat without seat belts, did not have a driver's license, and of course did not have insurance. So there we are. But the Pooja had talked me into years before when I got bought insurance for a car of getting uh, uninsured driver insurance. So we were okay with that. And we called the chiropractor. Cell phones had come into being. We called the chiropractor, said we were just in a wreck. Could we come in and get checked out? And he x-rayed us and said, by golly, this is just like a few years ago. You got, see your neck, you got some whiplash. Now, those are two kind of extreme instances. Some people would actually got mad at the drunk driver. And other people would have gotten mad at this woman who was driving the car. And by the way, it wasn't registered. So she was driving an unregistered car without insurance, without a driver's license, no seat belts on the children. She had done about everything wrong she could do. And both of those instances were great because I've told that story a few times because it would be a great opportunity to be mad. And I see this opportunity all the time on the highway, and you do too. You've driven by where everybody got in a hurry and the car behind ran into the car in front. And of course, when I got a driver's license, I was told that if you run into the back of somebody, it's always your fault. It's just the way it is. And I, I love it when people go, well, I wasn't doing anything wrong. And, and, uh, and they stop too fast. 
we had a fellow who used to come here, got in a pretty good wreck, totaled his car. And uh, he was turned around at the time. His two dogs in the back seat were nipping at each other, so he turned around to talk to him as he ran into this person and totaled his car. And he would tell us it wasn't my fault. Uh, she was, uh, she stopped. So you see him on the road. I see him. They're standing there looking like they're going to hit each other. They're standing in the road. They're not injured. They're yelling at each other. And they're both victims. I don't like being a victim. If you like being a victim, stop it. Because things are going to happen. And there is no control. You know, this is the bottom line. The Buddha taught a number of things that were rather sophisticated ideas. He didn't always say it the way we would say it. But one of the things he said was there is no control. You don't have control over anything. You can barely stop smoking. You can barely go on a diet. You go down and you buy a year's membership at a gym and you go twice. And you think you've got control over you. And that's the only thing you have any control over. Ask any married man how much control he has over his wife. Unless he's a tyrant and a brute, he has none. Ask any woman how much control she has over her husband. Unless she's a terrible hag in a nag, she'll admit he does basically whatever he wants to do. Now, it's a lucky person that can say, my husband or my wife, they love me so much, they're really concerned about what I want, and most of the time they go along with what I want, right? But most of the time they're selfish. And we plan a fishing trip, and the wife says, you know, they're having a quilt show at the fair. Could we go to the quilt show? Well, honey, I got my rod and reel out. I put new line on it. I got my little bag to catch the fish in. Wouldn't you like to have some food? No. Generally, we do what we want. I was watching a comedian the other night. He said a line I thought was so hysterical. He said, my wife will ask me what I want to have for dinner, and sometimes I'm right. I thought that was a wonderful line. Yeah. We like to blame everything on something else. Somebody else, something else. I was coming down the road, and I went off the road and rolled my car. Wasn't my fault. The road was going too fast. <laughs> Highway 18 out here, which goes right by us for those on the internet. Interstate Highway 18. A couple, three weeks ago, I'm coming back from Apple Valley Victorville area, and oh, you got to park on the road for 20 minutes because they were out painting lines. And we've all done it. We come down the road and they're painting new lines on the road because the, the, the lines faded. That's not what they did. From basically what we think of as the beginning of Apple Valley all the way through the Lucerne Valley, they painted double lines down the center of the road. Now, when I was young, and I had this little uh, driving class. I never took a class behind the car. I learned to drive in the military. I, we didn't have a car. So but we had a little class on how to drive safely and not open your door in front of a car coming at you and, you know, observe the speed limit and try not to do too many things while you're driving, like, oh, text on your phone, eat a donut, talk to your friend in the back seat and smoke a cigarette. Maybe you want to simplify what you're doing as you're driving along and pay a little attention to the road. So they, they painted these double orange lines. First thing they did is they painted the center of the road black. And then they painted these double lines. And we have double, and for those of you that don't know, because I learned it 50, over 50 years ago, a double line means you can't pass. 
It means there's a barrier, there's a wall in the center of the road. And they painted a double orange line, orange yellow line down the road, all the way from there to there, and put up no passing signs. And so a few days after they got done, I was going into Apple Valley to my Tai Chi class, and here comes this guy behind me, speed limit's 55, I'm doing 60, he's doing about 75, and he roars right around me, passes me, passes the guy in front of me, just barely gets over to the side because of oncoming traffic. And if he got in an accident, it would be somebody else's fault. And you can already already hear him talking, right? Well, that crazy guy without any hair, he was driving too slow. And I needed to get there. And it's important I get there. I can't be late. <clears throat> and this is all about being a victim. And Pooja and I, we went to the chiropractor and I said, we're pretty damn lucky. Look at that car. Look at that license plate buried into the door of the car, and there's no way in the world you could ever open the car. And we talked about how incredibly lucky we were. We had planned on taking a trip. We were going to take some time off, go down to a Balboa Park by San Diego to have a model train set up down there that's just blows your mind that this club has set up. They have all these museums, art galleries, and we were going to go down there and spend a few days, but we didn't. But the only thing I could think of is how incredibly lucky we were. I told some kids, because I was still teaching them about what happened, and they said, aren't you angry? I go, no. Well, they destroyed your car. Yeah, but that's why we have insurance. Well, the person was wrong. They go, well, yeah, people are wrong all the time. You're going to get mad every time somebody's wrong? You're going to spend your whole life mad. You know, you're going to knock about, I, I, you know, I read lots of different magazines, and the first thing you see now, particularly if you get a magazine for old people, I get some old people magazines, like ARP. I love ARP, because it's a bunch of old people talking about how they're not old. That's always fun to read. And in there they'll talk about, well, if you do this, if you do yoga, or, uh, you know, Zumba, right, you, you teach Zumba, yeah. If you do Zumba, you do these things, you'll add five years, seven years, ten years to your life. You know what, if you do just about anything, you'll add time to your life. You get up and you move. You get healthy. Pay attention to what you're eating. But these people that spend their life mad, they got to knock at least 10 years off their life. You know, the worst thing you can have is adrenaline all the time. Adrenaline's great if you're, somebody comes up and tries to mug you with a big knife and you think I got enough time to run away from this. Adrenaline's what you want. Somebody attacks, attacks your, uh, your family and you've got to stand up and try to defend your family, adrenaline's Great. And the rest of the time you don't need it. It, it puts wear and tear on the poor old body. Adrenaline is not a good thing to have in your body all the time. And when you get angry, it's there. We used to have a young man that came here, he was mad all the time. He was mad about everything. Everything was somebody else's fault. You know, it was never his fault. He didn't get a job. Well, did you show up on time? No, I was late. Well, what are you mad about? You know, are you willing to go out and dig holes? Well, no, he was in construction. He got mad when we had the Great Recession. You remember the Great Recession? I, to me, it was another depression. Everybody called it the Great Recession when everybody was out of work. And he'd say, he was mad because he didn't have a job. He was a really talented construction guy. And I said, well, do you go to McDonald's? Well, no, I can't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, because, meaning it's below him. 
did you did you go to the Mexican restaurant and ask if they needed a dishwasher? We had a young guy here. We went out for Mexican food, and he went back and asked him if they needed somebody. They needed a dishwasher, but he wanted to be the cook. And he was out of work. And he was always broke. And what's going on? It's somebody else's fault. And that, to me, is a victim. You know, you're only a victim when you allow yourself to be a victim. They don't like me, so what? So they don't like you. You might want to look at it and see if it's your fault. You might want to take a bath once in a while. I read something in a magazine, Reader's Digest, with large print. I read that a few years ago. I read there that, you know, what doctors would like to tell you. And it said, before you go to the doctor, take a bath. And I thought about that. That doctor's in there, you take your clothes off, and they're poking you, and they're smelling you. And I thought, oh boy. After I read that, I don't know if I ever took a bath before then, before I went to the doctor, but I did it afterwards because I thought, that poor doctor's got to smell me. You know? Old people. You ever smell old people? Yeah. Believe it or not, I know you're going to have a hard time accepting this. Soon I will be an old person. It's true. And I, one day I thought to myself, I don't take enough showers anymore. I don't really get very dirty anymore. But that's not why you smell. So then I said to myself, at least every other day, take a shower. Be nice to the world. Among a nice stuff, we get some French fries. He loves, he loves chili fries. He's hooked. We stop and get something. They don't. I don't want them smelling us coming through. He's a cleanliness anyway. You know, what are you doing? Take a shower. Did you already have three today? Yes, but you know, I swept the floor, so it's time to take another shower. There's always a good side to everything. Always a good side to everything. If you're still standing, there's a good side to everything. I went to a meeting of people that had heart conditions one day, and the person stood up there, nice guy, really nice guy, and he said, uh, it, it's a club, it's called Mended Hearts, and it's a kind of a support group. I do volunteer work with them. I go talk to people that are going to go after heart work. I say, it's okay, it's going to be all right. You're in a good place right now, and I'll see you when you get out. But he got up there and he said to this group of people, St. Mary's Hospital, which is, you know, they haven't been able to walk in there for a year and a half. They buy everybody in Mended Hearts dinner. So we go in there and we have chicken without salt. We have vegetables without salt. We have salad without salt. It all tastes a lot like cardboard. Because, you know, when you have blood pressure problems, you don't want to have any salt. And they've carried it to a science. And I eat a lot of fruit. And he got up and he said, you know, we understand when people go to the hospital, they're scared. I thought about that and said, I'm not scared when I go to the hospital. My crowning moment, the last time I went to the hospital, was when the EMT put me up so I could get intravenously fed as we whisk our way to the hospital so they could keep me from dying. And I said to him afterwards, I said, not everybody's afraid to go to the hospital. When I get in the door of St. Mary's, I figure I'm alive. This is, this is the greatest thing that happened on that particular day. Because if there's any way they can keep me from dying, it's going to happen here. If I'm laying out in this next to the building down there, and my, my dad went down with congestive heart failure and was laying on the ground for five days before my brother found him. And he survived. That was the interesting part. No, I think the hospital is a wonderful place. 
I like the nurses. I even like the food. Yeah, and there's no salt in it. And I haven't figured out how to get any salt in the food yet, but it sure tastes good because I'm still eating. Don't be a victim. Don't feel sorry for yourself. You've got nothing to feel sorry about. I'm looking in this room and everybody's alive. Everybody looks pretty healthy, even Larry. He looks pretty healthy. Larry does this wonderful work with wood. He makes molds and, and uh, pepper mills and all this on a lathe. And he was up at Palm Springs. You know what the temperature is at Palm Springs? 110 degrees, and he's up there setting things out on the table, you know, and selling this stuff. Because his wife got a little nervous when he retired. But, uh, they didn't have a lot of money coming in, so he self fix that. So he goes up to Palm Springs and Joshua Tree, right? Just Palm Springs now. Just Palm Springs now. Yeah. And he's a lucky guy. He can take that. You take me out there, and I'd be like a fish out of water. When it gets above 80 degrees, I'm in serious trouble. But it's okay. I stay inside. Long term school are on. He didn't put my little air conditioner up here, but that's all right. It's not bad up here. He takes good care of me. I had one of the monks last Sunday, one of the monk, the monk that, uh, that is in our chanting. And he looked at me as we were eating. He says, who takes care of you? I said, Mom takes care of me. Oh, okay. Because they're starting to worry about me because I look like there's something wrong walking around with a, I, you know, oxygen tube hooked to me all the time. No, I'm incredibly lucky. Fifty years ago, you know where I would have been? I'd been sitting in a living room in a recliner with bed sores and a big tank of oxygen. And that would be my life. That's what it would have been like, right? We didn't have these portable concentrators. And we had a fellow here about 15 years ago that had COPD and he had to use oxygen. He was, he was bad when he started coming, a wonderful man, but he got so bad, I think he like smoked cigars and inhaled them his entire life since he was like 14 years old. And he's at home. And I get a phone call and he's panicking, his wife's panicking because they can't get him to deliver any oxygen and he's almost out of oxygen. How about that? How'd you like to have that? And we had a nun here at the time. She was a bit of a feminist. And she got in her car and drove over to Yucca Valley and fixed that problem real quick. She took his empty tank and got it filled. But is this a big hassle? Beyond belief. Did it take me a while to stop yelling at it? Oh, yeah. Do I get aggravated when I go to walk across the room? Because I've got one down there with a big long tether on it. I can do all kinds of things. I can wash dishes, you know, I can vacuum, I can, I can and then I can trip and fall on this. 50 foot piece of this. Oh, poor me. How come I didn't get to have a wonderful life? I do have a wonderful life. It's just been a little modified. Mm -hmm. And all of our lives are like that. They get a little modified. You know? Larry, when he started coming here, was diabetic. The last thing in the world you want to be is diabetic out of control. I've got a friend that's been diabetic almost since I've known him, and I've known him for 40 years. And all he does is eat and drink and take insulin. I've got another friend, same problem, and all he does is go for dialysis every other day. Because abuse yourself long enough and you're in serious trouble. Larry decided he was going to fix the problem because he doesn't like feeling sorry for himself. So he got his weight under control and started losing weight. He called me up a couple months ago and said, went to the doctor, I'm no longer diabetic. That's an accomplishment because most people that are diabetic don't fix their problem. He goes out and walks. 
exercise, cut back on the carbs, blah, 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 blah. He really did what everybody should do that has that kind of problem. And not going to waste any time feeling sorry for himself. So don't waste your time. Okay, now this is interesting, what we have coming up here. Yeah, and it's time for us to do our little bit of chanting. It looks like the Day of the Dead in Mexico coming to the door. So basically what I'm saying is don't waste any time. Live your life. Have a good life. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy other people. Don't get upset because things aren't perfect because they're never perfect. Don't get upset because you can't control things because nobody can. You know, the one on the horizon now is global warming. We're going to control the global warming. I don't think so. Saw a friend a couple days ago, it was hotter than Dickens. He said it's global warming. I said, yep. So what are you going to do? All right, so these people like the chant that just came in. So they arrived so we could do our chanting at the end of the service. And I thank you for coming. Do we have lunch today? Yes. We have lunch today. Uh, soup. Larry. Soup. Okay. I thought we chili. Were. Chili. Yeah. Oh, we have chili. Yeah. Oh, Larry's back. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs>